I want to speak on the subject of growing faith, or exceedingly growing faith. Let's turn to Hebrews then, the 11th chapter and the 6th verse, and notice this, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Notice particularly the first part of the verse, but without faith it is impossible to please him. Now if God demands that we have faith, when it's impossible for us to have faith, then we have a right to challenge his justice. But if he places within our hands the means whereby faith can be produced, then the responsibility rests with us as to whether or not we have faith. Well, God has told us here that without faith it is impossible to please him. But he has also told us how to obtain faith. He has told us how faith comes. Well, how does it come? Let's see what he says about it. Turn to Romans, the 10th chapter, and the 17th verse. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, if we don't have faith, then it's not God's fault. To blame God for our lack of faith is nothing but ignorance. God has provided the way whereby everyone can have faith. Well, let's talk for a moment about faith for salvation. Faith for salvation cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You know, the Apostle Paul said that we are saved by faith. Ephesians 2.8, he said, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Now, how do you get the faith to be saved? Well, let's go back again to the book of Romans. We read Romans 10, 17. But let's go back to that passage in Romans and read it again. Let's start in with the 8th verse and, and read. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The 13th and 14th verses, he said, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now notice verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now he sums it up in the 17th verse by saying, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we see here that faith for salvation comes by hearing the word of God. Now, uh, hold that in your mind of what Romans said here, and turn to Acts 11th chapter, and let's read the 13th and 14th verses. And he showed us how he, now that's Cornelius, how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, now notice, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Now Cornelius was a good man, but he was not saved. You remember Jesus said in Mark sixteen fifteen, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. As Cornelius had not as yet heard the glorious gospel, he was not saved. God told Cornelius to send for Peter in order to learn the plan of salvation. The angel could not preach to Cornelius. Angels cannot preach. God sent men to preach. But the angel could tell Cornelius where he could get somebody, or go to get somebody. Who, as he said here, shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Men are saved by hearing words. Now why? Well, that's because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You cannot believe without hearing the word. Well, what about faith for healing now? How does faith for healing come? In the same way. Notice that it comes the same way. Notice here in the 14th chapter of Acts, the 7th through the 10th verse. And there they, that's Paul and Barnabas, preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, 
who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. Now, a casual reader of the word might say, you know, it's wonderful how Paul healed that man. But you know, Paul did not heal the man. The man was not healed because Paul was an apostle, nor was he healed by Paul's faith. The man himself had the faith. Notice what it said. Paul did three things. Verse 7, he preached the gospel. Verse 9, he perceived that the man had faith to be healed. Verse 10, he told the man to stand up and walk. Now, the man did three things. Verse 9, he heard Paul preach. Uh, and verse 9, he had faith to be healed. And verse 10, he leaped and walked. This man was not healed by some power which Paul had. The man himself had faith to be healed. Now, the question is, how did he get the faith to be healed? He got it from what he heard. He heard Paul speak. Now, what did Paul speak? Well, verse 7 said he preached the gospel. If Paul had preached what we have called the gospel, how did the man get healed? Paul preached what the Bible calls the gospel. I remember as a young Baptist boy on the bed of sickness uh, reading Grandma's Method Methodist Bible. The more I read, the more I realized that I had never heard the full gospel, but only a part of it. The more I read the word, the more I noticed that it didn't have to die at that early age. The more I read, the more I realized that I could be healed. Now, I had been taught that God could heal if he wanted to, which was even a bigger insult than saying he couldn't heal, because both are untrue. Now, as I read the word, though, the devil was right there trying to bring to my remembrance all the doubt and unbelief I'd ever heard. He reminded me that I'd heard that healing had been done away with. But do you know how that I was able to overcome that obstacle? I could never remember having heard anyone say that faith had been done away with. And you know, this crippled man at Lystra had faith to be healed. In Mark 5, 34, Jesus said to the woman who had just been healed from the issue of blood, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, faith has not been done away with. You know why it hasn't? Because the Word of God hadn't been done away with. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, Jesus did not say that it was his power which made the woman he, uh, whole. He said that it was her faith that did it. And I remember that when I saw this, I knew that if her faith made her whole, then my faith could make me whole. And thank God it did. My faith made it whole made me whole. My paralysis disappeared. My heart condition was healed. My incurable blood disease was healed. And as I say, sometimes I've been going at a hop, skip, and a jump, preaching the truth ever since then. Now, let's go back to this man at Lystra and ask herself this question. How did this crippled man get faith to be healed? Well, he got faith to be healed from what he heard. And what he heard was the word of God, the gospel. Now, is there something about the gospel that would cause a lifelong cripple to be healed? Decidedly, yes. Paul preached a gospel of salvation and of healing. In Romans 1.16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, there's a footnote in the Schofield Bible referring to this verse, and it reads, The Greek and the Hebrew, Hebrew words, for salvation implies the ideas of deliverance, safety, healing, and soundness. Therefore, Paul was saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto deliverance, unto safety, unto healing, and soundness. Paul preached the full gospel, not just part of it. Now look again to the Acts of the Apostles. Just notice Acts 5, uh, or Acts, Acts 8, 5 through 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and did what? preach Christ unto them. And the people with one, ho with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Now, these great miracles came about as a result of preaching Christ, according to verse 5. We're teaching from my book, Exceedingly Growing Faith.
I want to read again Acts, the 14th chapter, and then we'll go to Acts, the 8th chapter. 14th chapter of Acts, verse 7 through 10. And there they, Paul and Barnabas, preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. Now, I wanted you to notice this, that this man heard Paul preach, according to verse 9, and then according to verse 9, he had faith to be healed, and he leaped and walked. Now, the question is, where did he get faith to be healed? How did he get faith to be healed? Well, he got it from what he heard. Uh, he heard Paul speak, because Romans 10, 17 said, So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Well, now, what did Paul speak? The seventh verse said, He preached the gospel. Uh, you know, friends, it, this man got faith to be healed, this crippled man at Lystra. He got faith to be healed from what he heard. What did he hear? He heard the gospel preached. You see, the healing is part and parcel of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no real Bible gospel preached unless healing is preached. That is the healing of the physical body. Now let's look again to Acts the 8th chapter and let's look at verse 5 through 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Now, I, know, I want you to notice this, uh, that these great miracles came about as a result of preaching Christ. Verse 5. What did Philip do? Went out of the city of Samaria and cast out unclean spirits and, and, and healed the sick? No, no. All of that happened. Unclean spirits were cast out. The sick were healed. But what's the first thing he did? Preached. Verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. You see, uh, and then their miracles and the healings came as a result of preaching Christ. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The New Testament knows no Christ without Christ the healer. Physical healing, divine healing, is part of the gospel. If there is no gospel of healing today, then neither is there a gospel of salvation. P.C. Nelson, who was for many years a noted Baptist minister, said, Healing is part and parcel of the gospel. While pastoring a church in Detroit, Michigan, 1921, P.C. Nelson was run over by an automobile. Doctors said that his right leg would probably have to be taken off at the knee, and that even if it were not necessary to take the leg off, his leg would always be stiff, the knee would always be stiff. Now, as he lay in the hospital bed, he said the verses of Scripture in James 5, 14, 15 came to him. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with all in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. P.C. Nelson tried to excuse himself to the Lord by saying that they didn't practice this in his church. But the Lord reminded him of a certain man and his wife who believed in it and told him to call them to come to pray for him. Well, he did so, and they came, anointed him with all, and prayed the prayer of faith. He was healed, and his leg didn't have to be removed, neither was his knee stiff. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Several years ago, a fine denominational minister had an outstanding ministry. Various denominations or denominational churches would combine their efforts and sponsor him in large citywide meetings. In his evangelistic endeavors, he became sick, however, and by his own testimony, within two years, all of his money was gone. All of his bank account, uh, thousands of dollars on saving was gone. In order to pay medical bills, he had to sell his home, his car, and most of his library. Well, he had been everywhere, seeking medical help all over the nation, including the great Mayo Clinic. However, he was none the better, but rather grew worse. Finally, he was just simply in a county hospital in California where doctors said he would die. Well, he called his brother in, he said, who lived in California, and asked him to borrow some money for him to get a train ticket. This is many years ago, uh, before we flew and all like we do now. And most people went by train. And, and ask his brother to borrow the money to get him a train ticket, send him home to Texas to die. You see, their 83-year-old mother lived in Collin County, Texas, where I lived. And he wanted to see her before he died. Well, his brother borrowed the money and sent the ailing minister. Then in his 50s, 
back to the old home place where he'd grown up, and back to his aged mother. Well, there was a young man, just a 19-year-old boy who lived on the place, the farm, did the chores, and he became the sick man's nurse. And this required turning him, dressing him, completely caring for him. One day, the boy said to him, Doctor, why don't you let the Lord heal you? Because, you see, this man ha had an earned doctorate. And so uh, the Bible said that if there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church, let them pray over you. That's what the boy said to this great uh, minister of the gospel. Well, this minister had studied the Bible. He had been through seminary, but he didn't know what was in the Bible. He instructed the boy to get his Bible out of the trunk and find that place where that scripture is written. Well, the boy told him he had never learned to read. The minister asked him then how he knew that that was in the Bible. Well, this young man, the boy said, his preacher told him it's in there. And in fact, that he had uh, his preacher preached on it, use it for a text. And so this minister of the gospel had the boy to get his Bible, and he looked it up. And sure enough, he found this scripture. Well, this boy that was tending him told him that they were having a meeting under a brush arbor and there'd be a healing service that night. And so the boy told him if he wanted to go, the, that he'd get someone to take him. This great minister of the gospel, who had a world-renowned minister, decided to attend. So they brought him many years ago. They put him in the back of an old Model T Ford that made a bed back there, drove the car up as close as it could to the brush arbor. After the service, the preacher was preaching under the brush arbor, came and anointed this great minister of the gospel with oil and prayed over him. Well, it was midnight before they got home. But when they arrived, the minister asked his mother to let the boy fire up the old wood stove out there in the country so that she could fry him some ham and eggs and make him some biscuits. Now, he hadn't eaten anything except baby food and soft food in over two years. His mother, he told his mother that he was healed. He told her that the preacher had anointed him with oil and prayed for him. Well, the mother said later that she thought he'd lost his mind. And she thought, well, at least if he dies, he'll die full. So she cooked him some old-fashioned country biscuits. And uh, he ate the biscuits and the ham and the eggs. And he didn't get sick. He was healed. Well, he began to write articles then for publication in various magazines. And calls began to come in for revivals. A citywide meeting was arranged for him. And this boy told him that before he went to the meeting, he must be filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, he said he was ready to believe anything that the boy told him, so I asked him what to do. The boy told him how. They went to an old brush arbor meeting. When they gave the invitation, he went to the altar and knelt there in the sawdust, and they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues. Now, this ministry has long since gone on to glory, but his writings have been a blessing to many. Now, how did this man get faith for healing? He got it by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That young man who was seeing after him and who acting in his nurse just simply gave him what the Bible said, told him what James 5, 14 said, and 15. Now, I referred earlier to the woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. The Word of God tells us about her faith in the fifth chapter of Mark. We are told that she had spent all of her living and that she had had many physicians, but was none the better. The 27, 28 verses say about her, now notice, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, If I may but touch his clothes, it shall be whole. And in the 34th verse we read, And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now, where did this woman, this woman with a 12-year condition that was incurable, spent all of her living, suffered many things of many physicians, none the better, but rather grew worse. Where did this desperate woman get faith to receive healing? Verse 27, when she had heard. When she had heard. When she had heard. You see, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, how did she get faith to be healed? Well, she got faith to be healed by just the way you are going to or anybody else uh, that has faith, and that is by hearing the word of God. So then faith cometh by hearing, Romans ten seventeen, and hearing by the word of God. How are you going to get faith for healing? By hearing what the word of God has to say on that subject. Now, don't close your mind to it and say, well, that's been done away with. No, listen to what the Bible said on the subject, because you see, faith hasn't been done away with. Because if faith's been done away with, then the Bible's been done away with. 
because it said faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In the fifth chapter of Mark's Gospel, uh, we, we're told about this woman who had an issue of blood of 12 years, who had spent all of her living, who had suffered many uh, thing, uh, of many physicians, and had spent all of her living, now notice, and was none the better, but rather grew worse. Now then let's notice the 27th and 28th verses, what these verses have to say about her. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. I want you to notice that in the 34th verse, we read that Jesus said to her, and he said, that's Jesus said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now, where did this woman get faith to receive healing? How did she get faith to receive healing? Now, she was healed by her own faith. She wasn't healed by Jesus' faith. She wasn't healed, you see, just uh, whether she believed or not. Because Jesus said, Daughter, your faith did it. Thy faith has made thee whole. The Bible said in the 27th verse, When she had heard. When she had heard. Remember Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing. And so that's the way that she got faith to be healed was by hearing. I, I remember preaching a meeting of several weeks duration a number of years ago in one of our larger cities here in America. In fact, I stayed there for three months and uh, and uh, preached. Well, in addition to preaching uh, the regular services, uh, we had th this church had a daily radio program, and much of the time I would preach in the place of the pastor on the radio program. On one weekend, we had uh, some special missionary services. I didn't speak because these had been planned for a number of, of, uh, of months. And uh, so for just on the weekend, I didn't speak, then I picked up and began to speak again the next week. But anyway, on Friday night, after the service had been dismissed, one of the ushers told me that a man and his wife were there from another large city nearby and wanted to see me. The wife was sick and wanted healing. Well, her husband related to me as uh, that the fact that as he drove along one morning to work that he heard the radio program. Now, he had heard me make the statement that healing was for everybody and had gone home that night and told his wife about it. And all that week, they'd tuned in on the radio broadcast. The man went on to explain to me that the woman had two serious major operations was facing the third. And uh, then besides that, uh, she uh, had been injured in an automobile accident, had a steel brace on her back. The doctor said she'd have to wear the brace the rest of her life. Well, we had been praying, the husband said, that if it's God's will for her to be healed, that he'll give us the faith to believe that she will be healed, and they'd come for me to pray for her. Well, I began, to say, began by saying to them that it was unscriptural to pray if it be or if it be thy will, or if it is the will of God. When you put an if in your prayer, you're praying in doubt. I know some people think they're being number when really they're being ignorant. You know, after Lazarus had been dead for several days, Jesus said to him, Lazarus, come forth. He didn't say, if it's the will of God, come forth. And you'll not get an answer if you put an if in your prayers when you're praying to change a situation. It is only when you're praying a prayer of consecration that you put an if in the prayer. This is because in the prayer of consecration, you're not certain what the Lord's will is. You're not praying to change a situation or praying to change something. If is the badge of doubt, and it should not be in your prayers when you're trying to change a situation. So I asked this husband, if the New Testament said that Jesus took your wife's infirmities and bare her sicknesses, wouldn't it be his will for her to have healing? Well, he acknowledged that it would. So then we turned in the Bible to Matthew eight seventeen, which said that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And I remember that man said, well, it is God's will for her to be healed. Then his wife said that she saw it. Well, then we turn to 1 Peter 2.24 and read, Who his own self by our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Then we turned and read with them together in Isaiah 53rd chapter, verse 4 and 5, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 
Now the margin of many version of King James Version, uh, some of them read, as the Greek, uh, the Hebrew read, surely is born our sicknesses and carried our diseases. So, to, so this couple said then, all we need now is faith. We know that it is will to heal us. All we got to do now is just pray to God to give us faith to be healed. I asked them if they were saved. They replied that they were. Well, I asked them to describe how they got saved. They stated they'd gone to the front of the church when an invitation was given and had kneeled and prayed a sinner's prayer. Now, I said, when you went down to the front and knelt down there, did you ask the Lord to give you faith to be saved? Their answer was no. The husband said that the preacher had preached that they could be saved. He had read the word of God to the people. They had heard the word and faith came for salvation. Well, I told them, they had faith for healing, just like they had faith for salvation. They had heard the word. I remember that this man said, the husband said, well, we're going to have to throw away that prayer because it wasn't any good. I agreed with him. You see, friends, as soon as light comes, faith is there. Now, his wife agreed and said, I see that all I have to do now is to accept him as my healer. So I laid my hands on her and prayed. Then I asked her if she was healed. And she confessed, I surely am. And I know I am because God's word says that I am. Now, during the uh, following Sunday, the next Sunday night service, the vestibule door suddenly swung open. There was this husband. After asking if he could say a word, he began to tell what happened. He said that when they arrived home that Friday night, his wife pulled off her brace, threw it in the closet, and said, Thank God I'm healed. I won't need that anymore. Yet there wasn't any evidence of healing yet. The next Saturday, the next day then, when he came home, he said he found his wife stooped over the lavatory washing her hair, something she had been unable to do. And this Sunday night he brought his mother, who was in a wheelchair with paralysis to be prayed for. After prayer, she stood up and walked out. When hands were laid on the young couple, they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues. Now, years later, I talked with them, and she was still healed. Now, here's the point I wanted to get over to. How did she get faith? How did this woman get faith to be healed? From hearing the word, from the scriptures that I gave to her. And so that's the way that faith comes. I sell this to people. Whatever it is you're praying for, I've just been talking about how to get faith for healing here. But if it's not healing that you need, if it's finances, then read the word of God on the subject of finances and, and you, faith will come. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Uh, or, or faith for anything. Find out what the word of God has to say about it. You see, uh, uh, faith is, uh, comes. How does it come? By hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I remember a text in the Old Testament said, The entrance of thy words giveth light. As soon as the light comes, faith is there. It doesn't take any effort on the part of the intellect or the will of man to get faith. As soon as the light comes, faith is there. You see, Let's put it another way. The entrance of thy words giveth light. As soon as the word comes, faith is there. For Romans ten seventeen said, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now let's go to another subject, on this, uh, another verse of Scripture on the subject of faith. Let's go back again to the book of Hebrews, 11th chapter, the first verse. Here's a very important verse, the very first verse. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now here in Hebrews 11.1, 1, God tells us what faith is. Moffat's translation of this verse reads, Now faith means that we're confident of what we hope for, convinced of what we do not see. Another translation says, Faith is giving substance to things hoped for. I like that. Still another translation reads, Faith is a warranty deed, that the thing for which we have finally hoped is at last ours. Now we need to realize, friends, that there are a number of kinds of faith. Everyone, saved or unsaved, has a natural human faith. But here God is talking about a scriptural faith. He's talking about a Bible faith. He's talking about believing with your heart. And there's a vast difference between believing with your heart and, and just believing what your physical senses tell you. Faith is grasping the unrealities of hope and bringing them into the realm of reality. For instance, you hope for finances to meet the obligations that you have to pay. Faith gives the assurance that you'll have the money when you need it. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. You hope for physical strength to do the work that you must do. Faith says 
The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27, 1. Now notice, and listen, faith will say about itself everything that the Word says. For faith in God is simply faith in His Word. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Let's read that verse again. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, you see here, God tells us uh, what Bible faith is. I read to you several translations. Shall we read them again today? Moffat's translation. Now, faith means that we're confident of what we hope for, convinced of what we do not see. New English translation. Faith is given substance to things hoped for. And Rotherham translation. Faith is a warranted deed that the thing for which we have fondly hoped is at last ours. We need to realize, dear friends, that there are a number of kinds of faith. Everyone, saved or unsaved, has natural human faith. Uh, and that's one kind. But here, God is talking about a scriptural faith. He's talking about a Bible faith. He is talking about believing with your heart. And there is a vast difference between believing with your heart and just believing what your physical senses tell you. Faith is grasping the unrealities of hope, we said, and bringing them into the realm of reality. Faith will say about itself everything that the Word says. Listen carefully now. For faith in God is simply faith in His Word. I know many, many years ago, in being raised from the bed of sickness and disease, I learned what faith is. I remember that after being healed, after getting out of the bed, I needed work. Well, since it was in the Great Depression, it was not easy to find work. You know, men were standing on the street corners, uh, dozens, hundreds of them sometimes, looking for work, no work. How I was able to get a job in a nursery helping to pull up peach trees. With another boy on the other side of the tree, together we would pull up two-year-old trees to fill orders that had come in. Well, I want you to know that was work especially for someone who had been bed fast for 16 months and at this time had only been up a few months. I remember each morning before sunup we would meet and every day some of the boys would say, well, I didn't think you'd make it today. You know, two or three quit yesterday. You know, we worked from sunup to sundown for one dollar a day and so we met early in the morning before the sun was up and the men took us out in the country where we pulled these trees, you see. Now, I, I didn't believe in going around, and I still don't believe in going around trying to push something off on someone, but I did believe in witnessing for God. And so when they would say these things, it would give me an opportunity to say so. They'd say, we don't see how you make it. You're so thin and so weak, and others are falling out. I said, if it weren't for the Lord, I wouldn't be here. I would answer for you, see, His strength is my strength. The Bible says, the Lord is the strength of my life. Now, my life consists of the physical as well as the spiritual, and the Lord is the strength of my life. Well, when I would say that, that would make some of the boys angry, and they'd just curse, really. But I'd smile and say, praise the Lord, I'll be here tomorrow and every other day because the Lord is my strength. Now, I want you to notice, know this, friends, that if I'd gone by my feelings, I would never have gotten out of bed. I was never so weak in my life. I felt as if I couldn't do it, but I stayed with it. I acted upon the Word because I knew what faith is. One definition of faith, somebody said, faith is acting like the Word of God so. Well, I'd say to the Father and to Jesus and to the Holy Ghost and to the devil and to myself and to the other boys if they asked me, the Lord is my strength. But you know, I never actually got any help until I started to work. Many people want to get something and then believe they've got it. But you have to believe you have something, and then you receive it. When we began to work each morning, I wouldn't have any strength. But when we started on the first tree, or sometime the second, I would feel something come down over me from the top of my head. It would go through my body and out the end of my fingers, and out the end of my toes, and I'd work all day long like a Trojan. I remember one 250-pound fellow said, I'll tell you when this old 250 pounds is gone, there won't be a man left in the field. And I said to him, Why, Alton, God weighs more than 250 pounds. When you fall out and quit, I'll still be here. Now that riled him. But at three that afternoon, he fell out, and I was the only man left. In the natural, I was the weakest and the skinniest. 
but I was the only man left of the original crew. I had proved God's word. Now you may say that you know God's word is good, but you'll never really know until you've acted on it and have reaped the results. And this is what I'm trying to tell you that faith is. Faith is, as the New English translation said, giving substance to the things hoped for. I acted on God's Word. I went to work. I hoped for the physical strength to do the work. But it was my faith that gives substance to what I'd hoped for. Faith says, God is the strength of my life. As I acted on God's Word, faith gave substance to that for which I had, I had hoped. Now, a lot of people just hope, and they stop right there. And that won't work. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you say, well, I hope God heard my prayer, and that's all you do, he didn't, and there won't be any answer. But your faith can and will give substance to the answer to that prayer. Remember this. Hope says, I'll have it sometime. Faith says, I have it now. I remember reading some of the writings of John Wesley, the great Methodist preacher, the father of Methodism. And uh, Wesley said, The devil has given to the church a substitute of faith, for faith, which looks and sounds so much like faith some people can't tell the difference. Wesley called it mental ascent. Well, I, I can see that. You see, mental ascent sees what God says, what God's Word says, and acknowledges that it's true. But it is only with their minds that they are agreeing that the Bible is so, and that will not get the job done. It is heart faith that receives from God. Notice that the Bible said in Romans 10:10, 10, 10, For with the heart man believeth. Notice that Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. Now notice this doesn't say a word about his head. But shall believe, that is, in his heart, that those things which he says shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Now someone may ask, How can I tell whether I have heart faith or whether I'm just agreeing with my head? If it's merely mental agreement or mental assent, then it says, I know God's word's true. I know God promises me healing or the Holy Ghost. But for some reason, I can't get it and I can't understand it. But friends, real faith in God's word says, if God says it's so, then it is so. It is mine. I have it now. Real faith also says, I have it when I can't see it. Our text declares that faith is, now faith is, the evidence of things not seen. One who has not prayed in real heart faith may say, I don't see the thing about which I've been praying, so it hasn't come to pass. If the thing had come to pass, if you had it, you wouldn't have to believe it, you'd know it. You must take the step of believing to come to the place of knowing. Many want to know it first and then believe it. That is, they want to know it from the standpoint of having it come to pass. But we know it from the standpoint that God's Word says it's so, then it materializes. Now notice what Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty four: What things ever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now notice that the having comes after the believing. Most folks want to turn that around. In common everyday slang, Jesus said, you have to believe you've got it before you get it. I have never been able to receive healing for my body w without believing first that I had it even while every symptom in my body was crying out, you don't have healing. Then I would simply say to my flesh, the Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. So if you say I'm not healed, you're a liar. God's word says I am healed. Now when I li act like that, results are forthcoming, 100 times out of 100. I know if a person just sits around and groans and sighs and gripes and complains, waiting for something to happen, waiting until he can detect that every symptom's gone and that all flesh corresponds with his faith before he starts believing God, then he's out of order and he will never get very far. You know, Doubting Thomas said, I'll not believe until I can see uh, him and put my finger in the prints in his hands and thrust my hand into his side. Then when Jesus appeared, Thomas said, My Lord, my God. Jesus said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. In other words, Thomas wasn't believing the same way that you and I believe in Jesus' resurrection. He believed because he saw him with his physical eye. We believe it because the word of God says it is so. Here's a great faith verse, and that's Mark 11:24. What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. 
Now, let's notice that the having comes after the believing. Now, most folks want to turn that around. They want to have it first and then believe it. But in common everyday slang, Jesus said, you have to believe you've got it before you get it. Uh, I notice this, that so many people will just sit around and groan and, and gripe and sigh and complain, waiting for something to happen, waiting till they can detect the fact that all the symptoms have gone, all the flesh corresponds, and, and all circumstances uh, are in line before they start believing God. But you see, they're out of order. That person will not get very far. You remember the story about Doubt and Thomas, as we call him? Uh, in the 20th chapter of John's Gospel where Thomas said, I'll not believe unless or until I can see him, that is Jesus, put my finger in the print in his hands and thrust my hand in the wound in his side. And Jesus appeared to the disciples, you know, and Thomas was with them. And Thomas said, My Lord and my God. But Jesus said to Thomas, Because uh, thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. In other words, Thomas wasn't believing the same way that you and I believe in Jesus' resurrection. He believed because he saw him with his physical eye. We believe it because the Word of God says so. You know, friends, some people miss it without realizing it. They say, well, I believe in divine healing because I saw so-and-so healed. You know, that's not the reason I believe in divine healing. I believe in divine healing because the Word of God says it. Uh, I, I'd believe in divine healing if I never did see anybody healed. I believe in salvation, not because somebody got saved, because the Bible teaches. Now, I don't believe in speaking in other tongues because some people believe in it or because some people speak in tongues. I believe in it because of what the Bible says, not what I see or hear. My faith is not in what I see and hear. My faith is in what God says. Now, when we get our faith to that point, then we are right and in order, and that brings results. Now, Thomas said here, in effect, I will not believe until I see and Jesus said, Thomas, thou hast believed because thou hast seen. You see, his believing was based on his seeing. Our believing is based on what God said. Now notice, Thomas, uh, Jesus said, Thomas, thou hast believed because thou hast seen. Blessed are they which have not seen, yet do believe. Those are the ones who are blessed. Now, let's compare Thomas's faith with the faith of Abraham. In Romans, the fourth chapter, the 17th through the 21st verse. Romans, chapter 4, verse 17 through 21. As it is written... I have made thee, that's Abraham, a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those saints which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Now, I want you to notice the difference in Thomas's faith and Abraham's faith. Thomas had only what I call a natural human faith, which said, I'm not going to believe unless I can see and feel. Abraham, however, believed God's word considering not his own body. Now, if he didn't consider his own body, then he didn't consider physical sight or physical feeling. Then what did he consider? The word of God. The word of God. Notice that 18th verse there of Romans 4. Concerning Abraham's faith, he believed, it says, according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. That was God's word. I remember a number of years ago after I was healed of heart trouble, I was struggling along some of the lines that many people do. Alarm and heart symptoms seemed to return to me. In the night, I would have some terrible struggles. And though I'd been praying, standing on the promises, as we say, I couldn't get off to sleep. I said, Lord, I have to have some relief. Then he told me, consider not thine own body. So I just relaxed and said, thank you and took my mind off of my body and drifted off to sleep. Then I woke again, had some of the same symptoms. I said, Lord, I'm not considering my own body. What am I going to do? He said, consider him who is the author and finisher of your faith, your high priest. He told me what not to consider and then what to consider. Immediately I got my mind on him, and I began to consider what he had done for us. I considered that himself took our infirmities and bare sicknesses. As soon as I considered not my own body, but got my mind and attention on him, I drifted off to sleep and ever symptom left. Friends, too often we focus our attention on the wrong thing. We consider the body and the symptoms when it comes to healing. Now, that, that's what we think about and look at. The more we look at it, the worse we get.
Some will even say, well, God hadn't heard my prayer yet. I'm getting worse. I guess I'll wind up being operated on, and they will. One church where I held a meeting, there was a woman who testified every time she could, and at the end of every testimony, she would say, you all pray for me. I just believe I've got cancer. I remember finally the pastor got tired of it, and when she got through, he stood that and said, that's right, sister, keep believing for it, and you'll get it. For Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. I know sometimes some people say to me, Brother Hagin, pray for me. I believe I'm taking a cold. Well, it wouldn't do any good for me to pray, because if they believe they're taking it, then they'll take it. According to your faith, Bible says, be it unto you. If you keep believing for it, you'll get it. Do not consider and see the wrong thing. Keep looking at the right thing. That is looking at the Word of God. Listen to what God's Word have to say. Now, some people only get a part of what I'm saying, and then they think I'm teaching something like uh, the uh, metaphysical cults and so on, which I'm not, and saying to deny all symptoms and to just go on as though they weren't even there. But there's as much difference what I'm teaching and what the metaphysical cults teach as there is between daylight and dark. As one doctor said, this is not Christian science, but Christian sense. Now, we do not deny these things. They're real. Certainly pain is real. Sin is real. The devil is real. But notice what God's Word said. Abraham considered not his own body. So don't you consider your body. But do consider him, Jesus, our high priest, and the author, and the finisher of our faith. Focus your attention on what he has done for you, and on what he is doing for you. Because he is our high priest. He is doing something for you right now. He's right up there by the throne of God making intercession for you. Notice Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Or the margin says confession. Now I want you to notice this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Or, if you please, this is the reason we must hold fast our confession, because we have such a great high priest. Looking up the Greek word for confession, I found out that it says, let us hold fast to saying the same things. Jesus is up there representing us at the throne of God, and he's saying, I took their place. I died for them as their substitute. He didn't die for himself, friends. He didn't need to redeem himself. He wasn't lost. He died for us. He became my substitute. He took my sins. He bore my sicknesses. He carried my diseases. He died for me. He arose from the dead for me. He ascended on high for me. He's up there right now saying, I did that for him. And we are to hold fast to saying the same thing down here. That's what puts the devil on the run. Focus your attention on the right things rather than on yourselves. You know, here's a wonderful portion of Scripture that I love. Proverbs, the fourth chapter, verse 20 through 22. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them, my words, not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they, my words, are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. You know, many people fail because they see themselves fail. I know a turning point came in my life when I first saw this scripture. Until that time, I'd always seen myself dead. I could picture every detail about it. But after I read this scripture, let them not depart from before thine eyes, I could see myself well. I began to see myself alive. Notice what he said, let them, my words, not depart from before thine eyes. Now think for a moment. Don't you know that if God's word said in Matthew 8, 17, that himself, Jesus, took your infirmities and bare your diseases, if you do not let that word depart from before your eyes, you're bound to see yourself without sickness and without disease. Well, you can act on God's word. We're speaking on the subject of faith. We notice in connection with the subject of faith, these two verses of Scripture, Romans 10.10 10, and Mark 11.23, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confessions made unto salvation. Mark 11.23, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe, that is, believe in his heart, that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. 
And so you notice that in connection with believing, in connection with exercising faith, the word heart is used. We found out that the heart of man is the spirit of man. Now, for instance, Romans chapter 2, verse 28 through 29, Paul in his letter to the Romans said, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God now according to this verse the heart is the spirit we noticed also that the Bible calls the spirit the inward man notice Second Corinthians 4 16 for which cause we faint not but though our outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day there's an out- inward man and there's an outward man the outward man is the body the inward man is the spirit and of course we do have a soul now we man is therefore a spirit he is a spirit being. He's in the same class with God. We're talking about the heart of man because it's with the heart that man believes us. So we want to locate the heart. Man is a spirit. He's in the same class with God, made in the likeness and image of God. Now, some would have you to believe that man's just an animal. Well, if that were true, it'd be no more wrong to kill a man and eat him than it would be to kill a cow and eat the cow. Man does have a physical body in which he now lives, but he's not an animal. He's mu- he is much more than just mind and body. He is spirit, soul, and body. He is a spirit. He has a soul. He lives in a body. Now, it is the fact that man is a spirit that makes him different from animals. I know some false cults bring out that in Genesis, in the Hebrew language, the word of God speaks of the souls of animals. They say that since animals have souls as we do, uh, then when we die, we're dead as a dog is dead. And they interpret all scripture from the natural view. Well, it's true that animals have souls, but they are not spirits. In Christendom, we have not defined these terms as we should have. There is nothing in animals which is like God. God took something of himself and put it into man. He made the body of man out of the dust of the earth, but he breathed in the man's nostrils a breath of life. The word translated breath in the passage uh, concerning man's creation is the Hebrew word, which is also translated very often in the Old Testament, spirit. Well, it said God is spirit. Well, he took something of himself, which is spirit, and put it into man. When he did, man became a living soul. He wasn't alive till then, but he became a living soul. He became conscious of himself. Now, animals have souls, for the soul possesses intellectual and emotional qualities. And animals have these to some extent. However, in animals, it's all physical. All their soul quality is based upon their physical. And when the physical is dead, then all is gone. Man's soul, his intellectual and emotional qualities, is not based upon the physical, but upon the spirit. And when the body's dead, the spirit with its soul still exists. Notice in Luke, the 16th chapter, the 19th through the 31st verse, the Bible said there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and see Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil. Now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great guff fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. 
Now in this passage, we have a very vivid illustration of man's three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Notice that verse 22 says, the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, uh, who was carried away? The beggar? Not his body was carried away. His spirit is the real person. His body was put into the grave, but he, he was in Abraham's bosom. Now notice, the rich man also died. His body was put into the grave, but in hell he lift up his eyes. And although Abraham's body had been in the grave for many years, the rich man saw him. Also, the rich man recognized Lazarus. Therefore, in the spirit realm, man's appearance is similar to his appearance in this life. You can recognize him. You can know who he is. When the rich man cried out to Abraham, Abraham said to him, Son, remember, man is a spirit and he has a soul. We see in this scripture that his soul is still intact. He can still remember. He still has emotion. He's concerned about his five brothers. I have always been interested in this realm because, you see, friends, I, I, I preached about it many times, that I went to hell. It was on April the 22nd, 1933, Saturday night at 7.30 in the south bedroom of 405 North College Street in the city of McKinney, Texas. Just as Grandpa's old clock on the mantelpiece struck 7.30, my heart stopped within my bosom, and I felt the circulation cut off down at the end of my toes and all the way up to my heart. Then I had the sensation of leaping out of my body. Now, I knew I was out of my body. Yet I was no less man than I was when it was in my body. I began to descend. Down, down, down I went. As if I were going down into a pit or a well. I looked up. I could see the lights of the earth far above me. The further down I went, the darker it became. Finally, darkness encompassed me. Darkness, darker than any night man's ever seen. Darkness that was so dense that it seemed if you'd have a knife, you could cut a piece of it out. The further down I went, the hotter it became. It was stifling. My mind, my soul was intact. I thought of life, and my entire past come up before me. Still descending, I saw down before me fingers of light playing on the wall of darkness. I saw out in front of me a giant orange flame with a white crest. Then I came to the gate, the entrance of the portals of hell itself. A creature of some kind met me when I reached the bottom of the pit. Even though I knew he was by my side, I didn't look at me, for my gaze was riveted to hell. During the descent, I had intended to put up a fight, if I could, to keep from going in. At the entrance, I paused momentarily, although never coming to a complete stop. When I did that, the creature by my side took me by the arm. Now, my physical body was still lying on the bed, but there is a spiritual body, and that spiritual body has arms and ears and eyes and all the features the physical body had. You see, the rich man said, I'm tormented in this flame. He saw Lazarus and recognized him. Actually, I, in that place, could not tell any difference in myself except that I could not contact the physical and was not living in the physical realm. Bible scholars agree that Paul was talking about his own experience when he wrote, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth, such as one caught up into the third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I know what Paul meant when he said he didn't know if he was in the body, out of the body. Well, just as that creature took me by the arm to escort me in, a voice spoke. It was a male voice. I heard it as it boomed and echoed. I could not understand it because it wasn't English. as another tongue. But whatever he said, it shook that place, and the whole place just quivered. The creature took his hand off of my arm. Irresistible suction pulled me back, away from the entrance to hell, back into the shadows of the pit, and I came up head first out of that place. Well, I, I went down there three times. And the third time as I came up, I uh, began to cry unto God for salvation. And thank God as I began to pray, I was born again and became a new creature in Christ Jesus. Well, now several months later, I had a different type of experience of dying. Now then, I was a Christian. I want to get it over to you for this simple reason that I want you to understand that the heart of man is the inward man or the spirit and that it's with this inward man that we believe God for the Bible said with the heart man believeth.
We're talking about exceedingly growing faith. We're talking about faith. We're talking about believing God. We're talking about what it means to believe with the heart. Because, you see, the Bible said in Romans 10, 10, for with the heart man believeth. And Jesus said in Mark 11, 23, that whosoever should say, uh, shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass, shall have whatsoever he saith, shall not doubt in his heart. Now we've established the fact that the heart of man is the spirit of man. Remember we read from Romans 2, 28 and 29, but he is a Jew, the 29th verse said, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. Now according to this verse, the heart is the spirit. And then the Bible talks about the inward man. For which cause we faint not, the word of God said, but though the outward man perisheth, Second Corinthians 4.16, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The inward man is the spirit. The spirit has a soul. The spirit is the heart. Now, let's look again at some scripture here in Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter. I'm saying all this to you to locate the heart of man because it helped my faith when I could see and could say that I am a spirit being. I have a soul and I live in a body. Now, notice Second Corinthians the fifth chapter, the first verse, for we know. Now, we don't think so, we don't guess so, we don't hope so. No, we know. The Bible said that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, now that's our body, if it were dissolved, if this body were, were put into the grave, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, what is this building of God that's not made with hands? The body of man was made with hands. God formed the body of man, we know. Well, that's the inward man, the spirit. Now, then notice the 6th, 7th, and 8th verses of 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now the body of man was made with hands, as we pointed out. The inward man was not. When our body is put into the grave, we still have a building with God, not made with hands. Now who's going to be absent from the body, according to verse 6? We are. Who's going to be present with the Lord? Well, according to verse 8, we are. The Bible speaks of the inward man as being the real man, the real you. I say that to you so that you can see to believe God with the heart means to believe with your spirit apart from your body and apart from your soul or your mind. After that, I had re related to you my experience uh, of dying and going to hell before I was saved, and then I was born again, and about four months later, on the 16th day of August, 1933, at 1.30 in the afternoon, again, I knew I was dying. My youngest brother was standing beside my bed, and I told him to get mother quickly. Well, just as mother came, I had the same sensation I had before when I uh, had died. This time, though, I was saved, and I leaped out of my body and left it. Instead of going down, I began to ascend. I did not go down. I went up. Our old-fashioned house had high ceilings, and when I got up about where the roof of the house should have been, approximately 16 feet above my bed, my ascent stopped. And I seemed to stand there. I was fully conscious and knew everything was going on. Looking back into the room, I saw my body lying on the bed. My mother stooped over it, holding my hand in hers. She told me later that I held her hand in a death-like grip. But I had left my body. I could not speak to my mother to tell her goodbye. Then I heard a voice, and I looked up. I saw no one, but I heard a male voice. I don't know whether it was Jesus, an angel, who it was. But I do know that it was an emissary from heaven. This voice, this time the voice did not speak in a foreign tongue, but in English. And the voice said, go back, go back, go back to the earth. You can't come yet. Your work on earth is not done. When these words were spoken, I began to descend and I came back into my body. And back inside my body, I said, Mama, I'm not going to die now. She thought that I wasn't going to die at that moment, but I meant I was not going to die now at all. I meant I was going to live and do the work and the will of God. Well, I stayed in that bed almost 12 months to the day before I received my healing. For even though it was the will of God for me to live, he couldn't make an exception of me. I had to receive my healing just as anyone else does. And it took me 12 months to see it. You see, I waited there all those months for him to heal me, and he didn't do it. And if you're waiting for him to heal you, you're, he's not going to do it. 
You're just wasting your time. However, if you will begin to appropriate your healing and receive that which he has already wrought for you, you'll get it. And so you can see from Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, as we read to you the first verse and the sixth through the eighth verse, that my experience of dying was right in line with the word of God. Now, let's look at another portion of scripture, Philippians, the first chapter, verse 21 through 24. Here Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I, the inward man, live in the flesh, the body, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I wot not. Now notice, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart. Where is he going? To be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide, abide means live, to live in the flesh is more needful for you. Now, Paul says here, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. He's saying it's left up to me. I don't know whether I'm going to choose to go on living here for a while or whether I'm going to choose to go ahead and die. Some people say, oh, that's all in the hands of God. No, friends, it's in your hands. Many have missed it, thinking they were leaving it up to God as to whether or not they died, little realizing they were actually leaving it up to the devil because the devil's the author of death, not God. Paul died in exactly the way he wanted to die. He said, I don't know which I, I am going to choose. He did not say, I don't know what God's will is, or I don't know what God's going to choose for me, or I'm just praying that the will of the Lord be done. No, that's where we miss it. Paul said, I want you to notice what he said, I, the inward man, don't know whether I shall choose to stay here in the flesh a while, or whether I shall choose to go on. Now, the inward man, I read that and said all that to you, to get this thought to you, that the inward man, the spirit, the heart, is the real man. God is a spirit. He became a man. For Jesus was God manifest in the flesh, living in a human body. He took on a physical body. Yet when he did, he was no less God than he was before he had a physical body. Even so, when man leaves his physical body at death, he's no less man than he was when he had a physical body. This was true of the rich man. It was true of the beggar Lazarus. It was true in my own experiences. It is the inward man, the spirit, who contacts and knows God. We cannot know God through our human knowledge, through the mind. God is only revealed to man through his spirit, that is, his spirit. When I say through the spirit, I'm not referring to the Holy Spirit, but to man's spirit. It's the spirit of man that contacts God, for God is a spirit. Now, Jesus has a physical body now, a flesh and bone body, not flesh and blood. You recall that after his resurrection, he appeared to the disciples, and that they were frightened and supposed that they'd seen a spirit or a ghost. And Jesus said to them in Luke 24, 39, Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. He asked them if they had any meat, and they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb, and he ate it before them. Well, now then, there was a time when Peter said, I'm going fishing. The others went with him. Suddenly they saw Jesus standing on the shore. He spoke to them, and they came. He had fish on the fire, and he ate with them. Yes, Jesus has a physical body right now, a resurrected, flesh and bone physical body. God is a spirit. Notice that I did not say God is spirit. Some people think God is spirit, and that that means he's sort of an impersonal influence. No, God is a spirit. However, the fact that God is a spirit does not mean that he has no shape or form in the spiritual realm, because he did. Angels are spirit, the Bible says, and they have a form or a spirit body. In the Old Testament, the prophet of God prophesied deliverance when the city was besieged, and everyone laughed at him. Because they were in starvation and hunger and famine. Even his servant reprimanded him. And Elisha prayed, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see Second Kings 6, 7. Elisha wasn't talking about the servant's physical eyes, but his spiritual eyes. When the eyes of his spirit were open, he saw angels of fire, horses, and chariots of fire all around the city. And sometimes, as God wills, angels have the ability to take a form or appearance in the material realm where we can see them, but only as he wills. Now, notice what the Bible said in Exodus, the 33rd chapter and 20th verse. The Bible said that God talked to Moses face to face, so we know that he has a face. A cloud was there, however, and Moses could not see God's face. For God said, Thou canst not see my face, for, for there shall no man see me and live. And then God said, I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back point. 
my back parts. Now, my point is this. God is a spirit, yet he's no less real because he's a spirit than he would be if he had a physical body. Jesus, with his physical body, is in heaven now and is no more real than the Holy Spirit or God the Father. Spiritual things are just as real as material. In fact, more real, in fact. Now, in 1 Peter 3, 4, our spirit is called the hidden man of the heart. And so the inward man, the spirit, is called the hidden man. He is a man of the heart, or the spirit. He's the hidden to the physical or the natural man. The natural man does not know he's there, but he is, and he's the real man. In Romans 7, 22, the spirit's called the inward man. So the term inward man and hidden man gives us God's definition of the human spirit. Man is a spirit. He has a soul. He lives in a body, and it's with his spirit or his heart that he believes God. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. Uh, you'll notice the expression there, your faith groweth exceedingly. And thank God your faith can grow exceedingly. But we've looked at the, and are looking at the different aspects of faith. And as I said to you, I'm using my book to teach you exceedingly growing faith. Now let's look again today at one of the scriptures that we've been using uh, in connection with faith and believing. And that's Romans chapter 10, verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now notice the expression, for with the heart man believeth. We've established certain facts which we will sum uh, su uh, summarize for just a moment here. When God speaks in his word of the heart, he's not speaking of the physical organ which pumps blood through our bodies and keeps us alive. He's speaking of the human spirit, which is the very center of man's being. I remember as a youngster, I heard a man speaking. He called it preaching, but actually he was just giving an intellectual discourse. It wasn't preaching because it wasn't New Testament. It wasn't the Word of God. His so-called sermon poked fun at those of us who believed in old-fashioned, heartfelt salvation. He used the term heart literally and said that if a man had a change of heart, he'd have a heart trouble and die. His blood wouldn't flow right through his body. Now, this speaker thought that man was only mind and body. And, and But man is more than mind and body. He is spirit, soul. That's mind and body. Man was created in the image and likeness of God. And Jesus said, God's a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, we've seen that the spirit of man is not his mind. The mind is the part of his soul's qualities. You can readily identify the spirit if you speak with other tongues, because this speaking with other tongues comes from your heart or out of your spirit. Now you can see that to believe God with your heart means to believe God with your spirit or with the inner man. You remember we left off with a verse of scripture or two in our last discussion, which gives us God's definition of the human spirit. One of those verses was 1 Peter 3, 4, where it said, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And then another verse in Romans seven twenty two, where Paul said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. You see, the hidden man of the heart is the spirit, the real man. This real man, the hidden man, the inward man, is spirit. He has a soul, and he lives in a body. With the spirit, we contact the spiritual realm. With our soul, we contact the intellectual realm. With our body, we contact the physical realm. Now, you cannot contact God with your mind. You cannot contact God with your body. You can only contact God with your spirit. And God contacts you through your spirit. When you hear the word of God preached, you hear it with your physical ears. It then goes through your natural mind. But if it is to affect you, you must receive it in your spirit or your heart. Now, can't you remember before you were born again how the Word of God affected you on the inside in your spirit? The Holy Spirit through the Word spoke to your heart or your spirit. Knowing that God contacts us through our spirits helps us to understand 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. Another translation reads, The natural man or the natural mind understandeth not the things of God. You see, the Word of God is of the Spirit of God, and it's foolish to the natural mind. You do not understand the Bible with your head. 
It is spiritually understood. You understand it with your heart. Now, I know you've read certain chapters and certain verses over many times, never understanding the meaning. Then one day, as you read along, suddenly you see it. And you say, why didn't I ever see that before? Well, you see, it was just then that you understood it with your heart. You must receive the revelation of God's Word in your heart. Now, that's why we have to depend upon the Spirit of God to open and to unveil to us uh, the Word of God. Mark eleven twenty three and 24. We remember we use these verses where Jesus said, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you what things ever ye desire when ye pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. I remember my own experience that I've referred to many, many times. The entire 16 months I was bedfast, I tried to figure out what was meant by what things ever ye desire. When ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Well, first of all, the devil told me that it doesn't mean what it said. He told me that that doesn't mean what things ever ye desire, uh, uh, naturally or physically or materially, such as healing. My desire was for healing. That just means what things ever ye desire spiritually. Well, I'm sorry, I listened to the devil. And, uh, you know, if Mark 11:24 doesn't mean what it said, then Jesus told, told a lie. However, I didn't comprehend that then, so I decided to send for my pastor to ask him what the Scripture meant. But my pastor didn't show up, and, uh, and so uh, I, I'm glad really he didn't because I found out afterwards that he didn't believe the Bible either. Well, you see, again, my grandma asked another preacher to come, and he said he'd come, and he didn't come. Finally, remember, my aunt's pastor came, and I was trying to ask him. My, my tongue, throat was partially paralyzed, and I couldn't, you know, talk plainly. And I know I was just making sounds. I was trying to get him to get the New Testament and read Mark eleven twenty four and tell me what it meant. Isn't that strange that you'd have to ask somebody if Jesus meant what he said? I was struggling to get out the words, and he just took me and patted my hand, put on his professional voice, and said, Just be patient, my boy. In a few more days, it'll all be over. Well, it was dark in that room. He laid my hand down on my chest, turned around, and walked out. I want you to know it was dark. It was dark. It was dark. Well, I'll tell you, many months went by. But finally, the Word of God got down into my heart. I understood it spiritually, that is, with my spirit. You can't understand it with your mind. You see, uh, the Bible tells us, and we read here that the Bible, the Word, things of the Spirit of God are spiritually discerned, are spiritually understood. The Bible tells us that holy men of old wrote as they were moved by the Spirit of God. And so you know what things ever you desire when you pray. When you pray, means right then, the moment you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. And so I remember that I began to see that. I began to see it just like a light was turned on inside of me. And I began to see it. I said it out loud. You know, in common everyday slang, he just said, you got to believe you got it before you get it. And immediately I said, well, Lord, I see what I have to do. I must believe while I'm still lying here flat on my back that the paralysis is healed, not that I'm going to be healed. Many people say, I believe God's going to heal me, but that's not New Testament, believe it. I know, because I stayed in bed a year believing that and never got anywhere. Notice it said, believe that you receive and you shall have. You believe it first and then you'll have it. Someone said, I don't understand it. Well, you can't understand it with your head. The things of the Spirit of God are foolishness under the natural mind, and the Bible is of the Spirit of God. The Scriptures are spiritually discerned. You have to understand it with your spirit. Now, the moment I understood this verse, I began to act on the Word. You know, there's some way, always some way you can act. I began to act by thanking God. I couldn't move because my body was paralyzed. But yet I began to say, I thank God. I believe I receive healing for the paralysis. I believe my body is well. Well, my body was made well. Now, why? Because I began to believe with my heart. And you see, when you believe with your heart, with the heart man believeth, the Bible said, for with the heart man believeth. Believe it. Now, what does it mean to believe with the heart? It means to believe with your spirit. To believe with your heart, what does it mean? It means to, be, to believe independently of your head or of your body. Here's another verse, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. 
Here's uh, uh, the next two verses in Proverbs, the third chapter says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. In other words, don't be wise with natural human knowledge, which would cause you to act independently of the word of God. No, be wise with the word of God. And so therefore, Jesus said, therefore, Mark eleven twenty four. therefore I say unto you, what things ever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Now that belief is believing in your heart. Not believing with your head, but believing with your heart. And remember again that Hebrews 4, 3 says, for we which have believed do enter in the rest. You see, we just take God at his word. When we see that he said, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19, then we simply know in our spirits that every need will be supplied. We don't worry. We have no anxiety. If we're worrying and being anxious, then we're not believing. Our hearts take courage as we read the word. As we meditate in the word, our assurance becomes deeper. This assurance is in our spirits, and it's independent of our human reasoning or of human knowledge. It may contradict human reasoning. It may even contradict physical evidence. Believe in God with the heart means to believe apart from your body as well as apart from your mind or soul. It's to believe with the inward man.